welcome. And it's my pleasure and my job right now to welcome Dr. Moshe Schiff as our keynote speaker. And this is actually a return visit for Dr. Schiff, so we're particularly happy that he could come back again and share his wisdom with us one more time. Tell you a little bit about him. After getting a PhD from Hebrew University, he did a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard Medical School. And currently, at McGill University, he holds a James McGill professorship, as well as the Glaxo Smith Klein CIHR Chair in Pharmacology. In addition, he is a fellow at the Royal Society of Canada. He's the founding co-director of the Sackler Institute for Epigenetics and Psychobiology at McGill and is a fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Experience-Based Brain and Biological Development Program. Dr. Schiff and his colleagues hypothesized and also provided evidence that the social environment early in life, and I know that's something that many of us in this room, if not all of us, are directly concerned about, that the early life social environment can actually alter methylation, I'll let him explain what that is, of DNA. In so doing, they launched the field of social epigenetics. That's a portion of human biology that's actually confirmed that our social contexts early in life have molecular consequences, or another way to say it might be that at a molecular level, nature and nurture are in a complex equilibrium. I'll let Dr. Schiff take up the remainder. Please welcome Dr. Masha Schiff. Thank you for inviting me again to share with you uh, some complex biology. Uh, and I know not all of you are doing biology every day of your life. And my task is to talk to you in spite of this barrier. We inherit our DNA from our father and mother, 50% from each. That DNA has four letters in it, which comprise a language which we call the Book of Life. For the last 50 years, we focused on that DNA, which we call genetics, to explain everything that happens to us. Will we get cancer or not? Will we be good parents or bad parents? Will we be good lovers or bad lovers? We'll be smart or silly or stupid. We believe that everything that happens to us in life is written in that book. It's an old book. It's a few billions of years old. It evolves through evolution, and we inherited it from our ancestors. And that DNA is fixed. It remains the same. It doesn't change with what happens to us. And therefore, some people said it's not, also, it's not important uh, what we're doing with our lives because they're already pre-written. You can send a kid with good genes to that school, the other school, will not make a difference. He has good genes. A guy with bad genes, you can invest whatever you want. It's not going to help. So this idea was dominant. It has many, many implications, philosophical, religious, political, social. But the truth is that already for 60 years, we know that this is not the complete truth. Yes, what we inherited is really important. And some of us carry mutations that will cause disease. But it's not the whole picture. And the person who questioned it for the first time and who coined the term epigenetics, which is now very popular, but it's a very old term. It was invented in the late 40s by Waddington, a British scientist, who said, 
If this is all true, that what's ever written in DNA is 100% what's going to happen, then how come we have the same DNA in each cell of our body, but each of our cells behaves differently? Our eyes are not our livers. Our livers are not our kidneys. But the liver and the kidney have exactly the same DNA. So he suggested that something must be happening to DNA. He had no idea what it is. He called it epigenetic, something beyond genetic. Something will happen to DNA during development. When the embryo is in the womb of his mother, her mother, the DNA is evolving. There's 50 years of biochemistry trying to understand what is epigenetics. And this is clear chemistry involved in it. Our, although our DNA is uh, inherited, it's a piece, long piece of chemistry, it is packaged in different way in different cells of our body. So it could do different things. In the brain, it expresses certain genes. In the liver, it will express other genes. In the kidney, it will express other genes. But another thing that happens to DNA is that the DNA is punctuated during embryogenesis. It's punctuated in a way that the letters of the language make sense. If you put letters together without commas and periods and underwriting and overwriting and question marks, you don't really have a language. So what happens during development in the womb of our mothers, our DNA gets punctuated. It gets punctuated by a small chemical called a methyl group, which marks the DNA in special positions, so now the DNA could be read accurately in space and in time. Right? Our DNA has to function in very, very different ways, in very, very different times, and in very, very different places in our body. So all this is good. And when I started studying epigenetics, it was by total serendipity. I was ready to become a dentist and to make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, but I had to get a thesis to get my doctorate. So I encountered in a corridor the scientist who came back from Caltech, Aaron Razin, and I said, can I do a thesis with you? And he said, yes, because he was desperate. He was a young faculty member. He needed somebody. I was desperate because I needed a thesis. I couldn't care less what it was about. <laughs> and, and that's how uh, I started working on DNA methylation. So one thing he told me then is that all humans have the same DNA methylation pattern. And therefore, we are all marked in a very accurate way the same way. Right, look around, you all have eyes. Nobody has a liver here, we have an eye here. So everything is perfectly marked. And therefore, it's very interesting to study epigenetics from the point of view of development, but it's totally irrelevant to what you call development. We call development anything that happens from conception to birth. For us, development stops at birth, for you, development starts at birth. That took me a long time to understand that when a psychologist talks about development, it doesn't mean the second trimester of pregnancy, but it means what happens later in life. So now, I was told that this doesn't change. So we believed it doesn't change. And uh, we scientists also have a lot of dogmas. In spite of everything you read that science is truth, science is an attempt at arriving at the truth but it's never the truth. We always say things based on our knowledge that can change with time. And there was a dominant idea that the same way genes don't change, also the way genes are programmed doesn't change. It's highly predictable, it's all written in our DNA, and doesn't change. However, it took me a while to realize that there's something happening in life that have a huge impact in what we call the phenotype, which is how we behave and how we live and the kind of diseases we have. And one of them is the relationship between a mother and a child. It has profound impact, not only on the mental health of the child, but also on the physical health. And that relationship can happen in different environments. It could happen in this wealthy suburb of Miami or in the slums. And that has impact on the way the child developed. How is it possible? 
how could this work? Is it magic? So I'm a biochemist. I need to understand the molecular chains that lead from something to another thing. How is it working? And what I will tell you today is that actually the same mechanism that works during development to give our one DNA amazingly million, million different forms in our body, it's the same mechanism that registers experience in our DNA. So when we inherit the DNA from our father and mother, we inherit a sequence, and then it is forming cellular identities, and then it's forming experiential identities. So if I take now a DNA from a mummy that died 5,000 years ago, I can sequence the genetics, and I can tell you what ethnic background it comes from, who, who are his father and mother. I can sequence the methylation pattern. We can do it to the accuracy of every methyl group on the DNA and tell you what tissue it came from. And as you will see, Perhaps I can tell you even what kind of mother that person had. So experience and cellular identity are written into our DNA. So how does the system work? It's amazing in its simplicity. So what you see here, is this working, the pointer? No. It is working, but it doesn't reach there. So what you see here is the cytosine. It's one of the four letters of DNA. When the cytosine looks like this in a very critical position in a gene, the gene works. When it gets methylated, it shuts it down. Now think we have 20,000 genes. We have hundreds of millions of cells. In each one of them, there could be a decision, not only what gene we have there, but is it methylated or not? So think about it, we have immense possibility of combinations of how to express that gene. So you and I can have exactly the same sequence. We inherited the same DNA. But because these marks were positioned in different ways, we will behave and live differently. So this idea, if I can get the video, uh, that perhaps this sophisticated chemistry is not limited to, um, to development, to embryological development, that can be responsive to this kind of maternal love between a rat mother and her pups. So what the mother rat does to take care of her pups, she licks and grooms them. She also, of course, feeds them. And she has a special posture that, that she has when she does that. And people who observed this behavior, those of you who are humans know that humans do very similar things with their children, uh, <coughs> noticed that, that there is a natural distribution of how much mother rat does that. Certain mother rats will do a lot. And sender mother rats will do a little. And most mother rats will do something in between. So my colleague Michael Meany has followed these rats and noticed that when these rats are adults and their mother is long dead, there is a phenotypic difference between the rats that received high licking and grooming and the rats that received low licking and grooming. These rats that received high licking and grooming are less stressed, are more relaxed, are less aggressive. The rats that received low licking and grooming are highly stressed, sexually aggressive, usually end up in trouble, and will live shorter than the other. How is that possible? So I heard it for the first time in a meeting that I had in Spain, that I went to in Spain, and after the meeting, I bumped into a bar, and I started drinking beer, and here Michael Meany comes to the bar, and we started talking. So you, you know, I, I'm a hardcore biochemist. Maternal love of rats sounded to me like a 
tremendous waste of my tax, hard, hard earned tax dollars. <laughs> and uh, what alcohol does to you is that certain <laughs> things that you don't accept when you're sober, you actually accept when you're intoxicated. <laughs> so when I was deeply intoxicated, uh, we uh, started thinking about how is this possible? I mean, you guys know that. You have seen it in your practice. But for us, what happens in life is not important. What is important is we understand it, right? And so, uh, so how is this possible? We decided to investigate it. I was, at the time, working on DNA methylation and cancer. We discovered that most cancer are probably caused not by genetic mutations, but by these kind of changes in DNA methylation. And these actually give us hope because we cannot change your genes, but we can actually change methylation pattern, as I will show you, uh, with drugs and possibly also with other kinds of intervention. So I th we thought, perhaps it's like what's going on in cancer. Perhaps what's going on here is that there is a conduit, a channel of events from the maternal love to the way the DNA is programmed, and that remains uh, for life of the animal. So one way to test if this is genetic or not is to do a cross-fostering experiment, which we, of course, cannot do in humans, is take the rats that had a high mother and cross-foster to a low mother, and vice versa. You can cross it both ways. And what you found out was that what is important and these were startling news to us because we thought that it probably will be some genetics. So the low mothers probably have some gene that makes them different from the high mothers, and this is the same gene that makes the animals behave different. So that's the way geneticists will think. But what we saw was it's not the genetic mother, it's the caring mother that made the difference. So it can't be just passing through the genes. Somebody else, something else must be happening by the maternal care. And we spent almost a decade to try to unravel the biochemistry of that process. So what you see here is what we call a signaling pathway, a chain of molecular events by which the maternal behavior is translated to chemistry on DNA. And it is possible because when you receive maternal be, uh, love, you secrete serotonin, as you know. Serotonin will turn on signaling pathways in the brain that will now activate postmen, transcription factors that read zip codes or area codes, and can take that maternal love and deliver to the DNA at specific position enzymes that groom the DNA. And now the DNA looks different based on how much maternal care you received. This is, of course, just ex one example, and you can think about other cases. The interesting thing about this model is that any one of us has a gene that is in some sort of equilibrium. It's not a final state predetermined by evolution, but it is some sort of an equilibrium and the balance of that equilibrium was defined by many things that happened to us early in life and throughout life. The other important thing about it is that it is reversible. And this is where hope is coming. It's not final. It's very strong. It stays for life. But we could do simple tricks, actually using drugs that we use in our cancer models, to reverse the animals one way and the other way. So we could take the animals that look like received high maternal care, inject them a methyl donor, and they started behaving like low animals. And we could do the opposite, inject to the low animals a, a material that, remo uh, as, uh, that changed DNA methylation, and they started behaving like high animals. So on one hand, this is the strongest chemistry in nature. The chemistry between a methyl bond, methyl group, and a carbon ring is an extremely strong chemistry. On the other hand, it is reversible. 
It always confuses my students when I tell them, and I love contradictions, because this is the, the only true thing about life is that it's contradictory. And uh, so this is the model that we had, is that the gene is in a situation of a steady state, and that balance is being fed by signals that come from the world. And these signals could be physiological, like what happens during development, could be behavioral, could be social, could be chemicals. And actually, there's no difference between being exposed to PCB in a bottle, to lead in the walls, and to a toxic boss. In all these cases, what happens is chemistry is changed. The difference is, in one case, it's external chemistry. In the other case, it's the internal chemistry. And believe me, our brain and our body is the best pharmaceutical industry in the world. So we can build, as I speak to you now, you are making molecules, you are secreting chemistry that hopefully will register my talk for the rest of your life. <laughs> and so we need to understand that there is nothing that we're doing that doesn't end in some sort of a chemical consequence. So let's talk about what happens early in life. When a child comes to this world, he comes to multiple environments. And this is something we have to register. The psychiatrist thinks he's dealing with bodiless minds. The physician thinks that he's dealing with mindless bodies. Uh, the immunologist is only caring about the immune system. The dietician is only ca cares only about food. But the truth is that a child comes to this world in an integrated environment that involves a bioenvironment, which is all the bacteria that are in the cervix of his mother, the horses in the farm, the dogs and the cats, and all the animals around, the physical environment, which is the amount of light. For example, being born during the equator, close to the equator, you have days and nights which are equal. If you're born in the north, days are long in the summer, short in the winter, completely different circadian rhythm. Our DNA did not anticipate it. Evolution did not anticipate whether we would be born in Ecuador or in Seattle. So as the child is getting those signals at birth, the other thing evolution didn't anticipate is are you going to be born into an upper class uh, society where life is smooth and easy and you have to be just nice and smiley and polite? Or if you're born in a concentration camp, where your life is going to be saved only if you're hyper anxious, aggressive, and, 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 and vigilant. So that's not anticipated in the DNA. So we need to get those signals. How are we going to lead our lives? And so we believe that what the mother rat is doing in her licking and grooming, she's essentially interpreting the environment and providing her offspring with a interpretation of it that results in signaling pathways being activated, DNA methylation being tweaked, and eventually creating a phenotype that adapts the child or the pup to the world. Born in poverty, you need to binge every meal you get. Born in wealth, you have to go to the gym every day and you don't eat too much. But what happens in our society is that these signals that evolved in a long round of evolution don't always function. So there's a misfit. You're being told that you're poor and therefore you should binge every meal, but calories are cheap in America. Calories are so cheap that they're not a boundary anymore between the poor and the rich. So now the poor is eating as if there's no food but food is really cheap. So that creates a misfit. And you can think about other misfits. You were raised, you were programmed to deal with super aggression, and you find yourself in a middle class school. So your phenotype becomes a misfit, and you can think about how this can deteriorate into a challenge uh, to your mental health. So what I will suggest is that 
Epigenetics is not bad. People sometimes connect it with disease. There's nothing bad about a high licking mother or a low licking mother. Each of these mothers is preparing their pups to a different world. When it really gets bad, it, when there is a misfit between that preparation and the real world that the child is going to find himself in. And that's where we, need, uh, we get into trouble. <clears throat> so when we wanted to go higher in the evolutionary ladder to our cousins, the rhesus monkeys, and I collaborated with the great scientist at the NIH, Steve Sumi, who was investigating, many of you probably heard about him, for almost half a century, maternal attachment in monkeys. So what he noted is when monkeys are reared with a mother, they have a complete different phenotype. And that involves not just their behavior, which you would anticipate, but also their physical health, from getting more diabetes, being more aggressive, etc. Two animals that were reared without a mother. And what I wanted to know is, is this registered in the DNA? Is the removal of a mother, which is an extremely traumatic event for a mammal, is it registered in the DNA? Is it only registered in the brain? And how early is it registered? So I'll bring you an example from the immune system. These are T cells, the cells that regulate our immune response to bacteria and disease and cancer and everything else. And what you see here is a graphic representation of a, what we call a methylome, methylation across the genome. Every line, every row here is a gene. Every column here is a monkey. The color indicates how methylated it is, from green to red. And you don't have to be a geneticist to see that we could group those two monkeys very easily to two separate groups, the ones who has, have a mother and to ones who don't have a mother. And this is the immune system. This is not the brain. This is the immune system. Two weeks after they were separated from their mother, the immune system already knows, I have a mother, I don't have a mother, it's going to be a tough life, it's going to be easy life. I'll need a different immune system to deal with these kinds of environment. How early does it happen? How early do we sense our social status? So one of the things that happens to monkeys, similar to, happens to what happens to humans, and actually, if you want to understand a lot of your relationship, just go watch monkeys. You put five monkeys in a room. One monkey becomes the boss. The other one becomes the vice chair. <laughs> the third one becomes number three and is always the peon. And everybody knows who they are. The peon always knows to bow to number one. It's amazing. When we talk about inequity, we have to understand how dominant it is in the evolutionary ladder. It's not just with us. And one of the things that happens is that mothers who are high status are very different in their behavior than mothers that are low status. So we ask the question, if we take a placenta that just came out of the womb of the mother, does this placenta have registered in its DNA do I come from an upper class or a lower class society? And to our amazing surprise, it does already at birth. So this animal didn't have any social interactions. It's only the mother that had the social interactions. Already transmitted through signals from the mother to the placenta of the embryo. That low status, high status has a huge implication for monkeys. It's not bad to have a low status or a high status. It just tells you, you will have to get used to a different kind of world. And I'll give you an example. The low rats are doing extremely well in our cages when we provide them with all the food in the world. If we throw the low rats and the high rats to the wild, the high rat, who is an upper class kind of rat, walks straight into the mouth of the snake because he thinks all world, the whole world is just lovey-dovey, right? And therefore, the snake is just my friend. And he walks straight into the mouth of the snake. In that environment, 
the low rat will do much better than the high rat because the low rat knows this world is a bad place and I have to be careful. And what I'm telling is that there is no bad or good. It's morally neutral. It's evolutionary fitness. It's preparing animals to the world. So the amazing thing is that we can actually, by quantifying methylation of a few genes, predict the status of that animal. Is it low status, high status, or mid status? This is how important our social status is and the way our biology works. This is the placenta. It's not the brain, it's the placenta. A tissue that is responsible for passing nutrients. It also knows the social status. So does it happen in humans? Is early life, do early life events have the same impact? So in humans we can't do experiments, as you know, and especially we can, one of the problems with this whole field of child abuse and child adversity is to tease apart what is, so we all know that child adversity is not good for us and it causes a lot of trouble. But why did it cause trouble? Did it cause trouble because child adversity is causing the trouble? Or was child adversity caused by some bad genes that the mother and fathers of this child had? And it's almost impossible to tease it apart. And of course, you can see on both political spectrums, those who say, you know, tough luck, bad genes, or those who say, we can do something, child adversity is causing it. But there are events where we can actually ask it in humans. And this is when we follow natural disasters. Natural disasters are random, they were not planned. They didn't ask you whether you have the good gene or the bad gene. They apl were applied to the entire population. And we can ask the question, what happens to children who are exposed to stress at the perinatal period? And this stress that I'm going to talk to you is not a terrible stress. It was the Quebec ice storm of 1998. It was the worst natural disaster in Canadian history. For almost six weeks, our province has lost its electric grid because of this very unusual astronomical phenomena where we got almost half a meter of ice being dumped from the sky on the entire electric grid. And this happened in the dead of the Canadian winter, where the temperatures are between 20 to 30 below freezing. And our entire heating system is based on electricity because we have cheap electricity because of hydroelectric power. So now the entire province has no electricity in the dead of winter, and some mothers are pregnant, and some babies are being delivered during this time. So what my colleague Suzanne King did, she followed these children now for 15 years and asked the question, first she established an objective measure of stress because this is a very unusual case where you can actually measure the amount of stress objectively. For example, how many days you didn't have electricity? What did you do when you didn't have electricity? Did you go to your mother-in-law house or to your country home? And of course, the level of stress will be different. And so on and so forth. <laughs> and you can establish what she called a storm stress measure. And when the kids were 15 years old, uh, we took blood from their immune system and analyzed the methylation pattern. And by now, you should be expert in reading it. Each, each row is a gene. Each column is a human. And the color tells you uh, how methylated it is from green to red. And the, what we have here is what we call a Pearson correlation between the amount of objective stress and the level of methylation. And you can easily see how as the stress increases, these green genes become red and the red genes become green. So it is a complete rearrangement of the way genes are programmed in the immune system in response to a stress that happened 15 years ago. As far as phenotypes are concerned, Suzanne has noticed that these kids have a very high rate of autism. They have problems with sugar tolerance and they're starting to develop diabetes and also problem with the immune system. Go back to my slide, the three environments. The metabolic environment, the physical environment, dealing with food, dealing with bacteria, the immune system, 
and dealing with the other autism? How do you deal with other people in your uh, environment? And again here, I could take a few number of genes and establish what I called a stress methylation score. Could take DNA from these kids and predict the amount of stress that their mother has suffered. I believe that one day these will be tools that provide us objective measures of adversity early in life. So we wouldn't just have to ask the people what happened to you when you were six months old. Most of us don't know that. But we will be able to establish a marker very similar to when you go to your physician and it measures your blood pressure as a measure of uh, a health. So to summarize, what I showed you, that experience, triggers epigenetically propelled phenotypic changes. And this is not just tales of mothers of old villages. This is something that could be explained by real, hardcore biochemistry. Trauma early in life alters signaling pathways which then cause different programming, which can now cause a very different phenotype. And what we also know, which I won't have time to talk to you about, is that if you had that early life adversity, and now you encounter a second trauma, this will have different consequences. And we'll talk about this in the last slide. But remember that it doesn't end with early life, because we have experiences throughout life but how we are coping with those experiences to program our DNA again and again and again depends on what is on that DNA that came from early life experience. So what are the implications? There are numerous implications. This essentially, I believe, will change completely the way we approach social sciences. We will have the same tools in social sciences that doctors who were dealing with physical health had for a long time. So epigenetic markers could serve as early predictors of risk, of who should be taken care of because of marks of early adversity, without having to ask questions about what happened. And could serve also as proximal markers for follow-up. Many times we do interventions, but we really don't know if they work till we see the final phenotype. Whereas the the physical doctor has immediate proximal measures that he can see if his therapy is working or not before the final product. So these could provide proximal measures to see, are we doing something? And the main impact is, if indeed, when somebody suffers from trauma, the problem is that there is an underpinning, underlaying layer of epigenetic programming we will never get rid of the effect of the trauma till we are able to deal with the underpilling epigenetic programming. And we're trying and testing in the lab different ways to do that. And also, if we understand now the relationship between adversity, between trauma, and what happens in the phenotype, we have a better chance of being able to understand what makes some people resilient and other people uh, susceptible. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is could we reverse it? You see, I'm a pharmacologist. So we are pharmacologists, like you as therapists, believe that our job in life is not only to document human misery, as geneticists do, but to do something about it. And the nice thing about the epigenetic system is that it sounds like very deterministic, but at the same time, it's malleable to traditional pharmacological manipulations. So for the first 20 years, and I founded the first pharma in the world to develop epigenetic drugs to deal with cancer. If indeed cancer is caused by epigenetic change, could we reverse it? And that's becoming a very active field in cancer today. But I will show you that perhaps there is hope also in other mental health conditions. The last thing I would like to talk to you about is cocaine addiction. Addiction is a, one of the, as you know, I don't have to tell you, 
one of the most serious uh, plagues of our society. And here as well, we believe that there is two elements. There's the early life element that programmed the genome in a certain way. We know that not only in humans, but even in rats, when we expose rat to cocaine. So what we do here, we teach the rats to administer cocaine. Rats love cocaine. <laughs> like humans love cocaine. And they're very happy and they all press the lever to get their cocaine. And what we do is what happens in life. A pusher gave you cocaine in a party, you take it, and then nothing happens. So we remove cocaine from the rats and they're okay. So they don't have cocaine now for 30 days, which is a long time in a rat life. Rats live a year and a half. And then we don't give them cocaine, but we give them a movie of the party where they got the cocaine for the first time. And the way we do it in a rat is with a sound, like we do it in humans, a sound and lights. And when the rat sees the sounds and lights, it goes straight to the lever to press for cocaine. But we don't give their cocaine but the rats will keep pressing and pressing and pressing to get that cocaine. But if you have 100 rats, only 17 will do that. The others couldn't care less. They'll press, they see there's no cocaine, they forget about it. Like what happens in humans. Not all humans who see cocaine will become addicted. So you ask two questions. What happened through this time where there's no chemical exposure? The only thing the rats have is the dreams about the cocaine, but there's no cocaine, no chemicals around. So we found that the methylation pattern is dramatically changing during this month when there's no cocaine. This is, by the way, what's happening in rehabs. And that's why rehab fail a lot of the time. And actually what happens after we put these rats in rehabs, when they come back, they become addicted at a much higher level than they were before. And we understand the molecular events that happens. So, and you can see, I cannot see it here, you can see the level of addiction before rehab in black and after rehab in gray. So what we said is, if what we see is true, that there was a complete rearrangement of DNA methylation in the nucleus accumbens, which is the part of the brain that is involved in reward processing, the only way to cure these rats is to remove that, to remove these marks. So what we did is we treated them with drugs that came from cancer research. So on the right, we treated them immediately after they saw the drug. Nothing happened. In the left, we treated them after rehab. We gave them the drug once, and what we did is a combination of behavioral therapy for rats and pharma pharmacological therapy. So we gave them the movie of the party, and at the same time, we gave them the drug. The idea behind is if you do that, you're essentially evoking the systems open, so now they're ready to be changed with your drug. And you can see we reduced addiction dramatically. But what's more interesting, after 60 days, where they were not treated at all, still the rats that got the treatment were not addicted anymore. So we reprogrammed, essentially, their addicted state, their addicted epigenetic state. We believe that this is where we should go, to try to remove the underpinning marks, the adverse, the adverse marks of these early experiences or, uh, to, to treat them. We can also do harm. If we add methyl groups to these animals, what happens, they become super addicted. So now they become super addicted, and that again remains as a stable phenotype, because again, we changed our epigenetic program. So you can see what, what I was telling you to summarize. Message number one is that we are born into this world with fixed DNA and a dynamic environment. And evolution had to deal with this. And the way it dealt with it by developing a sophisticated epigenetic machinery. That what it does, it takes the environmental signals that are unified environmental signals. There is no chemical without social and there's no social without biosphere. They feed into signaling pathways. And I think it's important to understand those epigenetic changes are not just bad things happen to good people. They are programmed. 
they, we have the machinery to interpret the environment and translate it to changes in chemistry. And these are tweaking our DNA and are changing our phenotype to fit with the kind of world that we are being born into. But we need to understand that it doesn't end in early life. Life is a movie that goes on. It's not a fixed book. It's a dynamic movie. You know, that kind of, you get now from the cable companies where you have the remote control, and you can actually rem remove an actor from the movie and see how the movie is going to develop. So this is what we're doing in our lives. We're getting new actors, removing other actors, but every new actor that comes into the game, there's already a matrix of history behind. And if we both of us will go into the same car accident, my response of the epigenome will be different than yours because the previous script was different. And that accident will cause a, if for some of us, it will be nothing and will come out of it totally resilient. And for other of our, others, it will be debil debilitating, right? And that's because this new script is on top of a previous script. And this goes on and on as the movie of our DNA is being developed. And I would argue that there is enough data to suggest that this movie did not start in our birth, but actually started with our ancestors. So our ancestors are writing the movie. We keep up with this movie, we change it, and everything that we do has consequences on the way this movie is going to be unraveled. We are active participant in the movie of our lives and the movie of the lives of our future generations. So this, uh, I think, can summarize uh, what we said. And the next important thing is that we live in integrated environments. That movie is not just written by maternal care. It's not just written by food. It's not just written by bacteria. They all work together to send coordinated and integrated signals uh, to our DNA. And I'll just finish with all the people that I collaborated with. I don't have time to mention all of them. I'll just let you know that they didn't contribute anything to my work. It's all my work, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the greatest thanks I have is to the methyl group. This small chemical, I was 19 years when I was introduced to it and kept me in business for a lifetime. Got my kids to college. Uh, could pay for their weddings, and, uh, and I think it ha was an amazing journey. And I will let you know another interesting thing is I started, my first project was to understand the role of the methyl group in Phi X174. You never heard about it, and there's no reason for you to hear about it. It's a bacteriophage that infects E. coli that is not important for E. coli. But this is how science evolves. We don't do science because we woke up in the morning, I decided to get a Nobel Prize today, I'm going to design this beautiful experiment. It doesn't work like this. Science is done by serendipity, by accidents, by meetings. I get all my ideas from bars and cocktails <laughs> and by meeting different people in different places, by talking to each other, which is the point that was raised before, we develop, keep developing new ideas and new movies uh, that make our life hopefully improve it rather than the opposite. Thank you very much.